Uh, welcome to Rabbit Tears 2017. This is our third session of the year. And usually I'm here introducing people, but today I will be introducing myself. I'm Jade, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about deep learning. Um, so a couple of things. First of all, I tend to jam way too much into any session I do. So I've got three things I'm going to go through. Uh, there's code available. Uh, if you've been on check, been checking your emails or checking the Meetup or checking the Slack, you'll see that there are instructions to download if you want to follow along. There's a lot. I'm going to try cover it all. I probably won't end up covering everything, and I might have to skip along. So please keep your questions. You can ask them at the end. You can ask them during Slack. You can send me a mail or give me a phone call and ask anything if you have. So yes, deep dreams of electric sheep. Uh, does anyone know where that kind of reference comes from? Do androids dream of electric sheep? Yes. And what is deep dream? Google's deep dream, yes. So um, this is actually a quote from Philip K. Dick, um, one of the top sci-fi authors of all time, and Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep is the name of the book. It later got turned into Blade Runner, for those of you who know Blade Runner. Um, and this quote says, empathy evidently existed only within the human community, whereas intelligence, to some degree, could be found throughout every phylum and order, including arachnidia. So that lends the question. When we're talking intelligence, intelligence is something possessed by you know, your dog has some sort of sense of intelligence. A child that's just been born has some sort of sense of uh, intelligence. But when we're talking about empathy, we're talking about something greater than that. And that's something we've yet to achieve in machines. So what are the other things? What are the other things that we are yet to achieve in machines? Let's talk about creativity. Creativity is probably the next one where we're at. And that's probably what I'm going to be talking about a lot today. So today we'll cover, for those of you, big hands up for whoever has done anything to do with a neural network before, whether you've been learned in class or otherwise. Cool, and hands up for those of you who have never. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'm gonna run through the basics pretty quickly. I hope to give you a good enough background so that you can understand the rest of the session. Ooh, lights are off, fancy. Um, then we're gonna go look into how would we create a artificial artist, someone who paints. Um, and I'll be introducing you to two technologies over there. And lastly, we're going to cover the writer. How can we create creative agents that can write creative things? And these you'll see all involve different neural network technologies, specifically our favorite buzzword, deep learning, which everybody's using and throwing around even though most people don't know what it means. In fact, there's no agreed upon definition of what deep learning is. Um, but I'll explain a little bit about what differentiates deep learning from normal machine learning or normal neural networks. Also, um, yeah, social medias, I think they're also over there. You can't see them in the dark, but uh, at Team Retro Rabbit and hashtag Rabbit Year 2017. If you want to tweet or send photos or anything, we'd like to see what you guys are saying. Uh, send us some feedback or something, it'll be really cool. And let's get into it. Are there any questions so far? Ooh, when we're talking questions, put your hands up. And our friend Flippy, I don't know where Flippy is. He's at the back there. He's going to run to you with the mic. So are there any questions so far? Cool. Let's get into it. So the basics. What you see in front of you is a very, very basic neural network. And what this neural network is trying to do is predict whether someone's going to default on a loan. You can see that over here. We've got two, they're called output nodes. These are your, what you're trying to predict, default or no default. And you take a set of inputs. These inputs in this case are salary, age, prior, prior loan, and current debt. So the idea is given that we know what the salary, the age, the, whether they've got a prior loan before, and what their current debt is, can we train something to predict whether they're going to default on a loan or not? So. Mathematically, the way it works, well, I'm not going to go into the mathematics because that would be very boring and it's going to be very long and we're not going to get much done. So I trust that you'll do that either in your course or you'll go find it in your own time because that's going to be a very long lecture. But what it's doing intuitively is the way we train a neural network is particularly with a problem like this. If I go to a bank, they'll have hundreds and thousands of records of people who have these characteristics or have, like, have these attributes, so they've stored this data somewhere, or they have this data, and they also know whether they defaulted on the loan or not. They actually have this past data. And so 
idea is, what you do is you take this data and you'll be like, cool, this is my training data. I'm going to use this data to train the neural network so that one day this neural network can actually predict things based on these, um, these attributes. So we have a single pattern. We know the salary, the age, the prior loan and current debt of one person and we know whether they defaulted or not. We feed that through the neural network and the neural network kind of makes a bet. So it does a whole bunch of maths in the middle. So this is a whole bunch of weights over here and that's some functions and that's some weights over there. <laughs> And it does multiplies them all together, blah, blah. And it comes out with a, a best bet, like its guess as to whether this guy will default or not default. Now, right at the beginning, that is very random. So it'll just predict randomly. So if it's correct, you'll say, cool, you predicted you're going to default on the loan. And that was exactly what this guy did. He defaulted on the loan. So we're going to tweak all the weights in these parts of the neural network to more likely to, to make sure that it's more li probable that it will predict that the next time round. On the converse, if it said, cool, um, it predicted it was going to default, but the, I, the guy actually didn't default on his loan, then you'll, you'll tweak the weights to make sure that that outcome is less probable. That is how the basics of like a neural network functions, is well, how, it, how you train it. Is you have a lot of data, you feed it through, you check, is the output correct or not? Is it as our target data was, that we like from based on historical data, was that correct? And if it wasn't, you correct the weights so that it becomes more, uh, more accurate the next time. And basically, you feed it hundreds of thousands of these patterns, and maybe you feed them over again and again. And um, ideally, by the end of the day, you can have something that can actually try to predict those things based on those inputs. So there's your basics of neural networks. So those of you who haven't done, I hope that was helpful. Was that helpful? I'm going to look at Kenneth because he's going to say yes and okay, cool. <laughs> He'll respond. <laughs> Great. Okay. So, like I said, here's the process. I initialize my, initialize my weights randomly. I feed an input. The neural network makes a guess prediction based on a whole bunch of maths. I calculate the error between the target, which is what the expected output was meant to be, and our little guess. And then I adjust the weights, uh, they adjust the weights of the neural network to make uh, the correct output more probable. And we repeat this for basically, when well, I said every image, but you repeat it for every pattern that comes through. Cool. So I've rushed that. That was five minutes of like the entire neural network background. Um, now we're going to move on to probably one of the most complex neural networks you're ever going to see. So hopefully you're following along and maybe you'll be able to follow along for this part. So. Let's start off. When, if I'm an artist, first I have to have a concept of things, the world around me. What else? What, otherwise, what am I going to draw about? If you are, have no context on anything, you could draw random lines. But ideally, well, ideally, we tend to draw things based on other stuff, at least most of the time. If I want to draw a picture, I usually think, I'll draw another cat, and then I'll draw another cat. And the other thing is, like, cool, what style are we going to draw in? So we haven't reached the point a neural network can be truly creative. It doesn't have enough context. But what we can do is teach it to kind of mimic the style of other people and perhaps apply that to different scenarios or different uh, contexts. So that's essentially what we're going to teach you with the artist. So when we look at a picture, or at least when a computer looks at a picture, it just sees an array of, of pixels and pixel values at that. Um, to us, when we look at this, we don't see the pixel values we see a couple of very low, fine-grained shapes. So we'll see that there's a line over there. We might see that there are a couple of curves. We know at the end of there that all join together in our mind. This is very easily recognizable as an eight. A computer, on the other hand, if we were thinking about this neural network that I showed you earlier, the first thing that comes to mind is like, well, convert all those pixel values into one big vector, and just let's, let's train it like that. That should work. So we get loads of pixels and numbers, perhaps, feed them through, and uh, adjust the weights. But we just send it through this big flat line of, um, of uh, values, this big vector. That's it. So a little bit like that. So this is one that's going to pr predict whether the likelihood of it being an 8. Have we adjusted the sound, or is it going away? OK, I'm just checking. Um, so. I'm going to predict something with a likelihood of being an 8 or not an 8. Our input nodes would be just the pixel values. You've got some hidden layer in the, in the middle that will also just be flat and will predict the likelihood. That seems similar to what we did before, nothing different. 
but we've got some problems now. If you think of an image, you're moving, when you're converting it into a vector, you're essentially stripping out any spatial awareness it could have. It doesn't know the width of the image, it doesn't know the length. Even if you gave those as parameters, it probably wouldn't be able to learn, because it doesn't know that this pixel is a lot nearer to that pixel than any other one. So feeding it this vector isn't very useful. So the first one, cool, it, you can say cool, it's an eight, and then the one below, it moves, that eight just shifts slightly to the one side, and suddenly the neural network doesn't know what to do with it, because your entire array of values has completely moved over. Um, and the same goes for this one. It could be like, cool, this is definitely not a five, and you move it a little bit, and now maybe it's confused, because maybe there's some overlapping pixels. So this is why we can't use one of these very basic neural nets. It's because it kind of strips out that spatial awareness and it strips out that ability to, you know, this kind of hierarchical look where we see lines and those group together to form shapes and those group together to form other things. That's how our minds are working. So what some clever people did is they said, cool, let's try and mimic what the eye is doing a bit more. So what a convolutional neural network does is, well, it's got a, this looks quite complex, so you don't have to understand that. Even me sometimes, I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> this is what it's doing. <laughs> um, we'll go through it like in detail. Um, but that's what it's trying to do is learn this kind of, kind of hierarchy. And the key three things in here is called the convolution. So it's a convolutional layer, you can also refer to it. Uh, the idea of pooling and then a final layer of classification. That's the thing that it gets a lot of features and then it just spits out the, the correct output. Convolution, I'm gonna take a deep breath. Because I, I don't really breathe when I do talks, it's a problem. <laughs> cool, convolutions. The idea is, like I said, to extract these features, these lines, these curves, the shapes from an input image and also preserves the spatial relationships between pixels. The question is, how, do we, how does it do that? So the way they do it, or the way convolutional neural networks do it, is you have an image, let's say you've got a five by five image, and we've just got pixel values of zero and one. And the idea is you want to extract features. So these features they call filters. So you've got a three by three filter. And the idea is you want to basically use this as a this little filter is like a feature detector. So we're gonna run it across this matrix here, and we're gonna basically scan, looking for the actual feature and where it occurs. When it does occur, we're gonna say, cool, yes, mark on some other matrix somewhere that this feature occurred here on the image, and yes, it occurred here, and no, it didn't occur here. If you go a little, like, little view over here, you can kind of see it working like that. So here's our image, the little, yellow thing, that would be your filter or your feature extractor. And um, essentially, what, as it scans across, you're essentially just doing a um, uh, summed product of uh, the matrix of the values. The higher the value, the closer it is that that feature is there. So out comes this, what they call a convolved feature. So that basically says, cool, there's a high chance that that feature occurred where the highest values are. That's essentially what happens. Cool thing to note, your convolutional neural network learns through magic at this point, because I'm not gonna go through explaining it, um, if the values of these fil the filters on their own. So these little filters here, the three by three filter, it actually learns what they should be, or in, uh, yeah, it learns what they should be by itself, because it learns that the best way in order to differentiate these images is by having this feature, which is pretty amazing. So another little animation to explain it to you. You can see the first one's kind of got like a diagonal bar on the one direction, and it quickly scans through the image and it produces this feature map. That's that convolved feature I showed you uh, earlier. And you've got another one that's slanting the other way and it picks up another different feature. So you can see that actually those features are relatively similar, but the maps they create are slightly different. Cool, so back to convolutional neural networks. We have done step one. How are we feeling about step one? I see some, some confused faces, I see some okay faces. It's a bit convoluted, it's a bit convoluted yeah. <laughs> so this is, this is basically the bit I spent pretty much, I, I did the entire presentation in the first like three days after I decided to start working on it and I spent the rest of the time, probably three weeks, trying to figure out how to nicely explain a convolution, which is probably only 20% of this. Um, but to summarize, what it's learning is 
features. It's trying to detect where features. It's trying to pick up where lines, where the curves, and where they occur on this map. And that's step one. So that's convolution. Pooling, thankfully, is a lot easier. Pooling is the idea we need to reduce this dimensionality. So we've got we've actually got too much dimensionality. We know where things are occurring on a space, but we actually want something that can detect an eight on one side of the image and an eight on the other side of the image and an upside down eight and a bigger eight and a smaller eight. So actually we want to throw away some of this information as well as kind of scale down the dimensionality because these things get very big very quickly. So pooling does that, reduces the number of parameters um, that helps control for overfitting, which is that I can only know where the eight is in the middle of the, the um, image. And then it also gives this like invariance to small transformations. If there's like someone draws an eight differently to someone else, or there's something missing or something blocking the way, chances are it might be able to pick it up, which is very cool. So if we look at that, that's easy. You've got one of these feature maps, um, which we had earlier. And all that does is looks at a little stride across. And then says, cool, what's the maximum? This is called max pooling and just like puts that into the next layer. And it just goes through the entire image like that. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Cool. So here's your conv the output of our convolution and pooling layers is our first layer. You get maybe these little lines and these little curves and these dots. And the next layer would be a zoom out. So it groups those together and says, cool, so what are the commonalities between these? So now it's picking up eyes and noses and uh, ears. And the next one, it's zoomed out completely. I mean, this is, I think, a bit of a bit of a lie. I'm pretty sure this neural network that did this actually had like hundreds of layers. Um, the third layer actually picks up images of like faces, which is quite amazing, really. Um, considering human vision is something, well, computer vision has been a problem we've been struggling with for years. And we have all these advanced techniques to attempt to be able to do it, which we've had to handcraft, and none of them have really scaled. And now all we have to do is basically throw data at a big, giant neural network and tell it when it's wrong or right. And now it can actually predict or well, they can actually know what things are, which is amazing. So this is actually quite a, a well-known neural network. Um, I think, I don't know if it's lean yet. Should I actually check? Um, I've skipped out a couple of steps. There's this idea of rectified linear units, which is some math stuff, which I'm just going to ignore, because it actually doesn't explain the, the overall understanding of what a neural network does. So we've got the convolution, we've got pooling, and then maybe they put another convolution layer and another pooling layer. And some of these layers, uh, neural networks go to like 28 layers. That's kind of how they're built. Um, and you'll see a lot of people have their own specific architectures as to which one's better and which one isn't. And our last layer, these are just fully connected. These look like that first image I showed you, the basic neural network. And those are fully connected. Everything's, every node is connected to every other node, and that helps with your final prediction, dog or cat. And then they train this through some magical um, magical calculus, that is awesome, and you should definitely go learn one day, and I'm definitely not going to be able to cover this time. Um, here's a question, Flippy, do you have the mic ready? Where are you? Who, what would happen if we ran it backwards? Does anyone have an answer? So let's say I told it I want a picture of a bird, so I said set the, you know, that to one. What, what do you think would happen? So that's how they did Deep Dream, essentially, is they ran these neural networks backwards. And that's how they started generating things. Obviously, like I think Deep Dream went a little bit more involved and said, how can we do this better to make better images, et cetera? But the coolest way thing you can do here is in order to predict what the features that were fit in is you feed it the output and you'd be like, cool, well, now I know what came in. So that's pretty freaking amazing. So I'm sure a lot of you have actually spent time and actually looked at um, or played with Deep Dream. Um, it's just a very large convolutional neural network run the other way, which is awesome cool. Cool, let's do something. Code time. So if you have laptops, um, we did share this, but we're gonna use Python. Uh, I think I'm still on 2.7 because I think I suck at life. Um, gonna use Jupyter Notebooks, um, which is just a very cool way so that I can run little scripts of code and show little outputs. Keras. Uh, Keras is probably the most fantastic thing in my mind to happen to neural networks. It is the highest level neural network library I've ever seen. Um, so and you'll see later, the neural network code and the stuff we're doing is the minimal part of the code. The rest of the code is data processing and looking at outputs and things like that, but like 
the actual neural network part is probably five lines. Maybe a bit more with the convolutional because it's a bigger setup. Kira sits on two of our favorite neural network libraries, Theano and TensorFlow. TensorFlow is Google's baby. Theano is basically its predecessor. Um, and then Pandas, which is just basically good for handling data. And the thing we're going to do is we're going to train, or well, I have trained, and you guys can too, but you won't be able to finish before the end of the session, so <laughs> play with the code and then go run it afterwards, is um, a very popular data set called CIFAR10. And CIFAR10 basically trains, is a data set that you can predict. It predicts 10 categories. I think it's like plane, airplane, frog, bird, and a couple of others, cat, dog, very easy ones. Um, you can actually go get it at that link, but also in Keras they've actually got a built-in, so you can just use the data set and it'll download it for you and use it. Cool. So let's look at code. This one. Alrighty. <laughs> so this is a convolutional neural network, as I said. Uh, the nice thing about CIFAR 10 is you're working with very small Images, I think they're only 32 by 32 pixels. Um, this is good if you, because training takes really long. The bigger the image, the longer it's going to have to train. So you can see we're importing a whole bunch of curious libraries here. This is Jupyter Notebooks, by the way. You can see I've just kind of coded in here, and I'll be able to run each of these little paragraphs as they go. They're kind of cool. Um, so here we basically read in the data. So I'm loading in the data from CIFAR 10. Um, we're doing some utility stuff, converting um, things into categories, etc. Doing some normalization, so we can run that. And it doesn't output anything, it's just done some stuff in the background. Oh, there we go, it does. I outputted things. Oh, that's nice. Uh, basically saying that this is the current shape uh, of our data. We've got 50,000 images, that's the size of the data set. They're each 32 by 32, and they've got three channels, so that would be RGB. We split that up into um, 50,000 train samples and 10,000 test samples. Yeah, clearly there are 60,000 in the data set. Why did that split wrong? Um, let's take a look at the shape of our input data. So here's a pattern. Like I said, 32 times by 32, and then three channels. Our target dimension, so we want to predict one category out of 10. And our target vector would look like this. So everything's set to zero except the one where it actually is true. Cool. So I don't know if anyone's ever manually coded a neural network. Put your hands up if you've gone and coded the weights to a neural network at any stage. And then people <laughs> who clearly did the course I did, <laughs> where you had to code them yourself. Um, back in the day, you had to code every little line, all the operations. You're probably using C++ if you're a clever Java, if you weren't. And um, <laughs> no offense, it was faster. <laughs> that was it. Um, but uh, it's still the, the amount of code it took just to get the thing running. And that was a basic one, right? That was a two-layer neural network, like I showed you earlier. is insane. And this one, to build the entire convolutional neural network, one convolutional layer, layer two convolutional layers, max pooling, and, and then another set of convolutions and convolutions, which in themselves, we've, I've never even coded one of those manually. They're a nightmare. Um, more max pooling layers, and then the whole last set of um, fully connected layers. That is, that is your code. That, that sets it up. Here we specify what optimization technique it will use. That's how it trains. It does all the math math mathematical fun things. Here we set like what error type it would be using, the optimizer, and what metrics you want to follow. And we go compile. So now we have the entire structure of a neural network there waiting to be used which is fantastic, because it never used to be that way. So all you youngins who've grown up in this era where you just have to type 10 lines to get a convolutional neural network, I hate you guys. <laughs> cool, so we can actually run that. Does it outputs anything? OK, yeah, didn't output anything there. Um, and here's, here's an important part of convolutional neural networks, is um, you need data, and you need a lot of data. And what you can do is, expand your data. Because we know we want it to be impervious to rotations and translations, it's quite good to um, scale them and rotate them and shift them in different ways and feed that to the neural network, because we know what the output is and we want it to be strong against it. So what this little piece of code does is actually set up that uh, image data generator that will on the fly 
basically take a pattern and generate 10 more patterns, similar but shifted and transposed and moved around, which is pretty cool. I can run that, it won't do anything. And this is the bit I'm not gonna run. Here we actually got model.fit generator. That trains it. That one line does everything. So all the complicated math stuff, which I didn't go into because it's too painful to actually explain it, this line, you could call it, it does everything. You've got specify a couple of parameters, some, some epochs, you specify what your data is. This data gen.flow is basically telling you we're using the data generator to expand our data. And this is what we're going to expand. And this is our validation data set. That's it. And we run that. And it trains a neural network. And afterwards, we're just going to save it because I'm not going to run it right now. And I want to wake up and load it, which is essentially what I did. Oh, and I cleared the output. But when, damn it, I wanted to show you. When, when you run it, I'll see it show you on one of the others, you basically see, cool, it ran through the, like they run, they call it an epoch, when it runs through the entire data set for training once. And you'll, I think I trained it on like 10 epochs and it would run, 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 and you'll see your accuracy, which is your measure of how good it's doing, go up and up and up. And um, this neural network, a, it's a very basic, um, and it's a pretty stupid training thing, I didn't spend too much time on it. but. All it, it, you could actually see the training area get better and better and better, and then it started overfitting, so it actually started dropping at some stage. Um, and although it got to, I think, a 75% accuracy, which is pretty good considering it took two hours to train, um, it actually dropped at some stage because I wasn't monitoring it to drop down to, I think, 68% accuracy. So it's a little bit stupid, but that's okay. Cool. Um, so this actually loads the model into memory. Cool. So I saved one because I wasn't going to retrain it on the fly because that would be a forever. And um, this is just going to evaluate it for us. So we're going to just do some predictions. And I think we're going to predict 10 of them. So what this is doing is basically taking some data it hasn't seen and plowing it through the neural network and seeing whether it gets it right or not. And it's actually going to output the results. And you'll see it's pretty stupid. You run. Did my kernel restart? There we go. So there we go. It actually measured my model accuracy, uh, sixty-eight percent. And you can see it's pretty stupid. Very stupid. Let's go to one that actually predicted correctly. So I think the ship is a dog, and a dog is an airplane. 68% um, <laughs> sounds good, but in neural network terms, that only means that it's 12% better than random. Just keep that in mind. <laughs> um, so let's say we want to look at some of, which one did well? So it, it did well on, uh, where was dog versus dog? Yeah, 16. Uh, and it is a dog, excellent, great. Um, so what this is showing you is that I downloaded 100 lines of code, um, moved them into a notebook, played around with them. I didn't make any optimizations or anything, and I already got something that was doing reasonably well. Um, and by reasonably well, I mean reasonably bad. But if you look at the statistics for this data set, it actually has been doing very badly for years and years and years, up until we got to the point of convolutional neural networks. And if you spend a little bit, probably 50 more minutes tweaking some parameters and actually looking what it's doing, maybe basing your neural network architecture on something that exists, you can have something that predicts far better than this. So my challenge to you guys is to go make this work better. They actually run competitions all the time about who can actually predict the best on the, the C4100 data set. Cool. So let's have a quick question session. I just want to see how we're doing for time. Okay. Cool. Any questions? There's one over there. You might have to shout on that microphone, it's a bit rubbish. Uh, Is it on? You're gonna have to eat the mic. <laughs> like, I know you've never eaten a mic, but that's how you're meant to sing with them as well. It's like basically eat them. Good. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I didn't see your sigmoid function on the, on the Python. Uh, will you specify your sigmoid uh, for each layer? Yes, so usually on convolutional neural networks, oh, what am I doing? Usually on convolutional neural networks, they actually use something called ReLU, which is different from sigmoid. So sigmoid will be in those last two layers, which I can show you. Uh, da -da -da. Uh, that's the wrong one. 
Spoilers. <laughs> So, there we, so you can see here, oh, this one actually doesn't have a uh, sigmoid. Yeah, this one's got ReLU and softmax. I can explain why, but you seem to want to finish your question. <laughs> yeah, I was saying, uh, you don't run your own network without a sigmoid function, right? Yeah, so there are other functions. So neural networks, sigmoid is one of the popular activation functions. Activation functions is one of the things I did not explain, and they're actually one of the core things that's cool about a neural network because it basically enables you to be able to, you like, it, um, for your problems to be non-linear. And Sigmoid does that. But this one's got two others. So ReLU, or reactivated linear units. Instead of your Sigmoid, which looks like a, you know, your little curve, this one is a reactivated linear units, and it's actually, it, it's not even like that at some stage, it's just a line, because you basically select the maximum. Um, and that's been shown to work very, very well on these types of neural networks, because it essentially identifies, picks up the features that are actually being that exist. Um, and the last one is something called softmax. Um, softmax is used when you're predicting multiple categories kind of thing. So you basically predict, your prediction looks like a probability. It's like you, adds up, all adds up to one, each prediction. Um, and your greatest one is the one that's most probable, essentially. It's really useful. It's used, it's better than having five output nodes for a category in a way. It gives you one that can like basically reflect all your categories, which is cool. Mm. Uh, for your sorry, your predicted Muslim, does it um, does it be uh, if let's say uh, I feed it um, uh, uh, three neural three uh, layers in the neural network, mm -hmm. and then maybe two input functions, uh, does it uh, how does it get the correctness of your prediction? Does that uh, affect your performance of something? What do you mean by three layers? Um, so the neural network can have uh, layers between x and y. Yeah, so we've got a whole bunch. I think that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah, eight. So, why don't you show the layers? Why don't you show the layers? Uh, why don't you show the layers? Um, so, I think the correctness of the prediction is in layers or the input? So, both. Always. So your architecture, usually, I mean, most of the time your data is a problem, a lot of the times. In this case, it's probably architecture. And like I said, there's been a lot of study as to which, like, people go to competition after competition about who can build the best convolutional neural network architecture. So data is a problem. In this case, I don't think the data is too much of a problem. It's a really well-known set. It's quite a hard set, actually. Um, but the, um, but the, yeah, your architecture will affect it a lot. Or significantly. So in this case, it's, it's probably actually more to do with my training, I'd say. But your architecture can still make a significant difference. As I said, if it was one layer, we definitely wouldn't be seeing the... If, if it was one layer, we probably would need a lot more training time and able to get anywhere near. That's what my one lecturer used to say. Is like, cool, if you, if you can put more layers on, it'll just shorten your training time. It won't improve anything, <laughs> is what he always used to say. OK, cool. Um, so I'm going to continue, just so we can move on to the rest of it. Okay, so it's CFR 10. Um, so yeah, so I've, we've dealt with one. Okay, what to draw. Um, so this one's a basic one. It can identify or attempt to identify between 10 different things. Um, but people train on a much bigger data set. There's one called the ImageNet. It's massive. And by massive, I mean like millions of images and mil like hundreds of thousands of classifications. And humans have to go manually modify, like manually check these things. So they had teams and teams of people actually building up this ImageNet data set. Um, and a couple of great things about that is that if people train on ImageNet data sets, we can essentially have something that works on a lot of stuff, which is awesome. So now that we know what we can draw, uh, we need to teach on, like, get a neural network to understand or get our machine to understand what style to draw in. And that's where we come up with the neural style transfer. So I don't know if anyone's used the app Prisma. Anyone? Um, Everyone's like sheepishly admitting that they used it. <laughs> yeah, my sister downloaded it and I thought it was cool. <laughs> like, um, but what's cool about Prisma, it's not just a selfie app to make you look like some shitty artist drew you. Um, it's a really cool piece of neural networks that's happening, well, neural network things that are happening in the background. So if we look at what we have here, this is how the basics of it is um, we have something that extracts the content. So. This is what our base image needs to be, and we want to extract the content. There's a wolf looking away at a mountain, and it needs to look like this. So we have a content extractor. Then you want something that extracts the style of Van Gogh, in this case. Cool, and extracts all the things, like this is what his lines look like, his strokes. 
And then we want something that merges them together nicely, and then we get a final result of um, an image of a wolf looking at a mountain that looks like it was drawn by Van Gogh, which is pretty cool. So that's basically what I just explained. So how are we going to do this? Well, we've learned a lot about convolutional neural networks. So we're going to use a pre-trained um, neural uh, convolutional neural network. Um, this was one uh, VGG19 won a couple of like a bunch of competitions. Um, the, I think it's the most famous one for um, neural networks or for convolutional neural networks. And um, we're going to take this neural network. We've seen that that's got all these different layers, and this one's massive. Um, 19 probably means 19 layers or 19 convolutions for all we know. And it's got it's one of these massive things. And um, the last layer decides you know what it is. But let's stop instead of going there. Let's try take one of the intermediary layers, because that will tell us what the context is. Like, what is the content? What is in here? There are lines. They group like this. They look like faces. They look like mountains, et cetera. So we don't have to know what it is. It just needs to know like, how to redraw this content. And we do the same, actually, with the style instructor. And um, you go use the same uh, VGG we've got. So you feed in the style image. And then you go extract the one layer. So that layer has got like a load of weights and activations. You calculate it up until that point, And you use one of those earlier layers. And a merger is actually not going to be a neural network. It's going to be a basic optimization. Um, and optimization is another field that's used a lot in AI and mathematics and statistics. And um, it's essentially about minimizing error. And the area you're trying to minimize is a style loss, which is you can read the paper about it. It's how they calculate what the style is and how to like, get something closer to the style. Uh, content loss, that's a, another paper that you can go read about the content. And then a total variation loss, which is how much is it actually vary, varying from the image. And we can actually specify that as a parameter um, to optimize to. The opti optimizations using this guy, LBFGS optimization. I don't even know what that is. There are hundreds of these. I learned a whole bunch, and I keep learning more, and now I've come across this guy. It's probably some basic one that I just somehow missed because I didn't do stats. Cool. Not there yet. So some more code. This one's quite fun. Uh, there we go. Style transfer. Once again, something that seems like it should be a lot of code, but really isn't. So some details you can read through. Some stuff. I'm going to skim through this. Um, do some pre-processing, pre-processing of deep, deep pre-processing the image. Um, this is a style transfer function. This is where the bulk of everything occurs. Um, so you basically take your, your base image and your style reference image. You do pre-process both of them and you store it. Um, and basically, um, this is a whole bunch to do with channels. I won't go into the details. And you create a big vector that you're now gonna gonna handle. Cool. Um, and now you're gonna compute your your loss function based on like your content and your content weight. Um, more stuff. I'm not gonna go through it because I have too much to go through. Evaluator. This is the thing that actually calculates your loss. It's quite. Uh, icky, because I can't actually explain the details of it because I don't understand it quite yet. <laughs> um, and here's basically the bulk of it. Um, this machine, we basically give it like the, the image, we give it what the loss function is and how to calculate it, and it goes and minimizes the loss. And then afterwards, it deprocesses it and it actually saves the iteration. So what we're going to do is going to run it just for 10 iterations, and you can see how it actually improves the image. So once again, this is mostly like Filter code. Oh, there's some that probably should have been in the previous one above. Yeah. So these are actual loss functions. Content loss, style loss, everything. Okay. So let's change from what I had earlier. Wait. Let me see if I've still got it. Cool. So I had some images. I can show you. Mm-hmm. Cool. I've generated them already. Boring. But this was going to be my base image. And then we can use Van Gogh as our other image. Cool. So this will be our base image. And we want to apply the style of this one. And I didn't delete them. So lame. I'm hiding them so you can't see them. 
already had the pen. this little function, do style transfer. And I'm just going to run the whole notebook because I haven't run it. I'm going to run the whole notebook. It won't be like that. Run all. Oh, there we go. So it's loading the iterations. Live demos. I didn't even change anything then. I think this is no TensorFlow. No. Yeah, okay, so this is a tensor problem. So what happened is I've loaded my convolutional on it, and now that's sitting somewhere and it hasn't reset, so I'm probably going to have to restart the kernel quick. While I do that, I'm going to delete all the images so you can't see that. Everyone look away. I need another screen. Everyone following so far? <laughs> Is everyone kind of following so far? That's very silent. I hate silence. <laughs> okay, give me two secs. I have to use both hands. It's fine. You can't really see them. Okay, great. You didn't see any of that. Mm -hmm. Final cells. Please don't error. I've just deleted everything. Please don't error. That's taking a little bit long. Oh well, I'm gonna have to restart. Bear with me. Uh, are there any questions while we're waiting for this? Uh, cool. Take two. Sorry, I restarted the kernel. Oh, God. Okay. I can hear my graphics card. Oh, there we go. You can usually hear when a machine is machine learning because suddenly it goes completely crazy. <laughs> it kind of sounds like when you start running Java. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> cool, I can see these appearing. So let's open this one first. So you can see it's really starting to, to change a bit. A little bit more, a little bit more. You can see there's a loss function here behind it, and that's getting smaller and smaller. That's the optimization error getting better and better. Ooh. Cool, so let's make that a bit bigger, so you can see. Still actually improving on it, but it won't make too much difference. Cool, and there's Audrey Hepburn in the style of Van Gogh, which is pretty cool. And that was less than 100 lines of code. Awesome. Uh, shall we do another one? Yes or no? Yes. yes, okay. So I've got some other sample images. I can't, I don't know why this keeps doing this. I've only recently switched to Ubuntu. I'm a late bloomer, sorry. So we've got Picasso, so we can try Picasso or Warhol, your pick. Picasso. This is our style image, we're going to style transfer. Cool. There we go, there was... Oh. Really? No. All right. Okay, so we want Picasso. Um, let's go. Oh, tier two. Navigate it again. Why it keeps losing it? And again. Okay. 
we want? I think it's this guy. Yeah, it could be that one. So there's Audrey Hepburn. You can really see she looks a bit different. That's the previous one. And you can actually see the difference between the two styles, quite notably in that. That's Van Gogh, and that is Picasso. And she's still training more. Oh. Hurry up. Oh. There we go, iteration six. Okay, and it actually doesn't get too much better than that, not noticeably anyway. And there's Audrey Hepburn, and she looks a lot more like Picasso now. So you can see the features are started getting more strict. And this is Prisma. This is what Prisma is doing. Um, it doesn't know probably, they've probably spent more time on um, tweaking parameters and making it look better. Um, but this, uh, there was no tweaking. I coded this, ran it, and this is what we got. So that's awesome. So now we have our artist. It can't necessarily come up with things on its own quite yet. There are techniques of doing that. Um, but what it can do is you can give it, tell it what, you know, about things and generate things and then you can apply styles to it, which is cool. And once again, as we, I mentioned earlier, if you run it through a convolutional neural network backwards, it actually can generate images, which is quite exciting. Okay. So, like I said, very dense. Is anyone following on their laptops and has actually tried to run anything? Did you run it? Um, not successfully. Oh, damn it. Well, well, who was it? Kuda? No, no. True was not defined. True is not defined. Uh, I'm sorry, did I not push the changes? <laughs> okay, so let's go to the writer. Okay, this one I feel a bit better talking about because um, this is actually what I'm busy doing at work, which is awesome. Not necessarily generating things I can write, but doing um, more natural language stuff. Um, so let's talk about the writer. Um, Things that are different from, if we're understanding an image, an image you see at once, you know, it doesn't change, it's an image, and you need to process all that. Uh, the writer is all about progress of time, because words come in stages. When you read, you don't look at it at once and understand everything, you read each word, and you build up meaning over time. A standard neural network does not have a time component um, at all. Um, with a standard neural network, by the time you feed it the first character, by the next character, it would have forgotten what the previous character was. So what we're going to do with the writer um, is create a character prediction predictor. So we give it a little hint. So we say, cool, here are 40 characters with some words. And we're going to train it on a whole bunch of song data and teach it to predict to basically write songs, which is cool. And we're going to do that via the recurrent neural network. And recurrent neural net networks are interesting. Because like I said, they work over time. So if I input a word, I'm going to, go, I'm going to talk about words, but actually, actually when we do this, we've simplified it a lot to just the characters. It's actually amazing how it, the neural network learns how to write words, just giving it knowledge about characters. We tell it nothing about meaning or structure of actual words. We teach it about characters. We give, yeah, we give it knowledge about characters, and it learns to predict words. But let's say we, get, let's say we give it a, a, this neural network a character. If I say, you know, the cat sat on the mat, by the time I get to the mat, I want to still know about the cat. So how do we do that? We use kind of an internal memory. So that, let's say this was an entire input vector, so that entire bit of input that was on the one side. We input that into our hidden layer, which was that one in the middle, and that outputs something. But then we take that output, and we feed it back in. So when we feed it the next word in the sequence, it still has that context of what came in before. And what we do is we combine this memory over time. So we build up this bigger picture. So by the time you get to the end of the sentence and you fed it all the characters individually, it actually knows about everything that has happened. And it's memorized it, which is pretty cool. Um, so here, so let's say I'm going to feed it can't even. It needs to be able to predict n. Can't even. So if we say we give it a context, and, and this is actually how a lot of neural network stuff works. It's all based on like context, because that, well, how recurrent neural network stuff works, because the words we say are actually, their meaning is determined by the, the words around it and the characters around it in that on a fine grain point. So if you feed it a C, 
And you can see at each of these layers, it goes down. So that when we feed it an A, that input from before, it remembers. You feed it an N, and it remembers the prior input. And this could happen for the entire thing, up until even. And our target is that it needs to predict N. And that is a recurrent neural network. That is the basis of it. Um, how they actually implement it is quite complex, um, particularly the ones used in natural language. They use something called a long-term short memory. is a really popular one, LTSM. Um, a long short-term memory. I always get it the wrong way around. Um, or another one called GRU, which are quite popular. So that's the basis of it. We're going, we've got the writer. We're going to train um, a lyrics writer using a character predictor. So not even doesn't even know what words are. We're just going to feed it characters at a time. I'm using the song lyrics data set from Kaggle, which is a wondrous data science website if you want to play around with stuff. And we're going to use the long short-term memory neural network to be able to do it. And I'll get to that now. And it isn't what you think it is. OK. Mm, let me, I'm just going to restart the kernel. Oh, the kernel doesn't seem to want to be there. Let me refresh. Cool. OK. So once again, you can go download these and run them. Um, recommend it to run on the GPU as it goes for images because um, recurrent neural networks and CNNs are quite computationally expensive. And if you want to try this little script on new data, it's very easy to feed it in. Um, but try and make sure it's got um, like 100K characters. And as it says, 1 million is better. It's just going to take you longer to train. I didn't have long to train. so. OK, so let's have a look at our data. So I'm using pandas, actually, to read it in. Oh, I thought I was using pandas. Let's... OK. Oh, I did something. Oh, good. So that's written our data, and we've just outputted the tail. So this is right at the end of our data set. We've got some things from Ziggy Marley and something from Zwan. I've never heard of Zwan. I hope they're good. Um, and you can see that our data set consists of artists, songs, links, and text. And the bit we only care about is the text. We actually, we're not going to teach it about artists or songs. We just want to feed it like, this is what lyrics look like. Lyrics look like this. You know, and then ask it to like generate some. <laughs> Why is this funny? <laughs> um, cool. So um, what they usually call a batch of things in NLP, like your um, thing that you're going to train it on, that's called a corpus. These are often books. They are um, the biggest, well, well-known ones are Google News and Wikipedia, if you're doing more complex stuff. Um, but our corpus is a bunch of songs. And I've actually just taken the first um, one million characters out of the entire song. So I concatenated everything together, and I just took the first 100 million songs, 100 million, 100, 100, one million characters out of the entire batch of songs, of which there was a lot more. Um, so you can actually run that. We do some pre-processing. That's uh, the actual full length, and I've just taken that many. And uh, total characters is the number of types of characters. So that's, um, I think I lowercased it here, did I? Uh, maybe, oh, there we go. I did lowercase it, okay. So that's just to like decrease my search space and shove, like actually left in punctuation, which I probably shouldn't have done. Um, cool, and the idea is, the way the training works is I want to give it a, a window, so give it 40 characters, and then tell it, you know, that the target character must predict the one that comes after it. And then I shift my window a bit, and I say, that's my next data pattern, predict the next one. And then I shift that a bit, that's my next data pattern, predict the next one. And you build up your entire data set like that. Uh, so let's run this. Cool. And that actually builds up the number of sequences we can use. Um, I actually do that in, so yeah, so now we've got this, these batches, they're all our training patterns. Um, but neural networks don't understand what a character is, so we need to encode that in some way. So they encode it in what's called a one-hot vector. So this, in this case, it'll be of dimension 50, and the character that it is will be one, and everything else will be zero. Um, to generate, I've created a generator for that, which is basically a way of, like I said, generating it on the fly. So as you're training, it generates it. And we, we do that because these things take up a lot of memory, and they really, really do. So you want to generate as much stuff on the fly and get rid of it as soon as possible. 
So there's that. Um, and here's the model. So you thought the convolutional neural network one was easy. That is the long, short-term memory one. It is five lines. That's to actually create the model. And it's quite complex. LSTM's got lots of little memory components and gates and weird shit. This one basically says, cool, there's my long-term short memory. That's the number of units. That's the shape of my input. Here's a little dense layer at the end um, to actually predict the characters. And then I've got a soft max activation like before. It's got categorical cross entropy for the loss, because that's because we're using multiple categories and we're using a soft max. And it's got an atom optimizer, which is just a better than your normal um, gradient descent one. I'm run that too, it doesn't tell you anything. Um, we've got an output of a soft max. Soft max, like I said, predicts the most probable character. If we want to produce something to actually generate stuff, we don't always want to choose the most probable character. Our way of adding a little bit of creativity is just to inject a bunch of randomness. <laughs> so we do that by using this little sampler that'll just basically sample, let's most of the time choose the most probable character and sometimes choose the second most probable character to be predicted next. This is used for prediction and not actually in training. So now the actual training, there we go. That's even less lines. We've got diversity, diversity is actually just what we feed into the sample, don't, don't even worry about that. The bulk of it is just this line. I specify the no, like chunks it needs to go in, that's something you'll learn if you get deeper into neural networks. Specify the number of epochs, the number of times you need to feed through the data. And dot fit, that's it, that does the training. Cool, and you let that run, and um, you get an output like this. And you can see these are all the epochs, these are each of the data patterns, so you can see that's, this will run as it goes through. And you'll see this number over here is a loss and it gets less and less and less. And sometimes it goes back up again because the stuff's quite random. And it gets less and that's, that's our final loss. I could run this for a lot longer and get a much better, a much better loss, but um, I actually wanted to use my computer for something else, so I stopped it. So I saved it um, and I've got it here so I can load it back in. Theoretically, did that load? Yes, it would have. Okay, um, so we have two sentences here. One of them is created by Flippy earlier. Um, this one I created earlier. Um, which one would you like to run, one or two? Two flippies, yeah, yeah. So we run it, ah, oh, fuck, sorry. <laughs> Whoops, let me just run all the things. It needs stuff up here that I didn't run properly, probably that guy. Is it? If that's TensorFlow, I'm going to be really irritated. It looks like it. TensorFlow is a bit of a memory whore. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I know. There you go. Great. I swear it ran earlier. I needed that. I needed some data. I can read that one. I just don't, I, don't, I can't run all because I can't run the trainer. I should probably just remove the one line. Okay, I'm not running that guy. This would be a favor. I need to run the model. And then that guy. And there we go. Cool. That's how it's going to generate it. Familiar like family, ancient it's gravity. I got a trink that I can't be. I can't tell my thing I got when I was the stranger <laughs> that I don't want to love you. I want to be, want to be where I can be. Something, it's a chance. You know it hurts. <laughs> I'm still me a white life and I don't want to be. <laughs> I want to stay. I'm Miggers. <laughs> Miggers. I don't know what that is. I, I can't really weigh. I can't see me in my heart. It's true. And I can't see me. You can, you can see me one, great. So, so that's a song, and that was just from characters, right? So I haven't taught it words, I haven't taught it context, I definitely haven't taught it meaning. Um, we were theorizing earlier, I'd probably chuck some of those directly that it you know, might have overfitted on words that were used often. That I don't want to love you, I mean, <laughs> I'm sure that goes in loads of songs. Um, but what's amazing about this, and what's amazing about it is the fact it's learned words at all. So I just fitted a bunch of stuff I just fed it characters and it learned coherent words. Sometimes it learns to rhyme. So depending on what you feed it, it can like, it figures out what I, one I had earlier, it rhymed five, like five lines. I was like, how did you know? <laughs> um, 
so yeah, so you have your writer. Obviously, we can, you know, you can probably, you can probably go work on it a bit more. Um, I think we can stru structure this in some courses. That would be great. Um, and the reason it's probably producing this kind of more unstructured stuff is we only gave it 40 characters. We gave it a history of 40 characters and said predict the next thing, and then a history of 40 characters. Oh, shut up. Notebook. Don't do that. Okay. And we gave it a history of just 40. If I gave it maybe 120, maybe it would learn about entire choruses, which would be cool. Like, what is it to learn about what a chorus is and be able to predict choruses? Um, so that's, that's wondrous, and that's a l very few lines of code. So let's play. Who wants to be a, you know, the the muse for this sentence generator, uh, for this lyrics generator. A quote, anyone? Should I, am I gonna have to Google like top quotes by Chomsky or something? Yes. Is this the real life or is this just <laughs> Yes. I'm gonna have to put the mic down, hold on. Like, Yeah, so we can only give it 40, but it'll truncate it, so. Okay. Uh, no, guys, just chilling. What is? I. Oh, sorry. I lowercased everything, so it doesn't know what capital I is. This is just Fanto, and we can't feel she was a glade. <laughs> we can't, I can't we mean to show. I can't tell you holding you my love. <laughs> I can't let the words, but I know what you, uh, what, what you take you. I want to be with you. That occurs a lot, yeah. I can't let you to stay. I'm a little bit of your heart. I, I want to be with you. <laughs> Ooh. I, want, I want to be there in my head. Oh, everyone does. <laughs> there's, there's a lot, you know. I want to be a chance to go, and I can't get a touch. Uh, uh. There we go. Uh. Okay, so that, that's that's fun. I don't know about you, but I find this stuff fun. And this is also something um, that I, based on some other code I did, but I, I did a Nietzsche generator because why not? It was a very very miserable neural network. Um, <laughs> so this is more fun, and um, because I truncated it, it's essentially learning on probably. A to E, so there's probably a fair amount of ABBA in there, and um, I don't know what else, Beach Boys, and <laughs> any other prolific artists of the genre. Um, yeah, so that, that's the writer, so that's the last bit. So that's actually the, the large bit of the basics of neural networks. You've got convolutional neural networks, which are the pain in the arse to explain, and a lot of nightmare, um, but probably some of the most powerful stuff we've, we've had so far. And then we've got recurrent neural networks, which are used for dealing with text, they're used for dealing with um, Speech to text, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, yeah, any anything that's a sheer sequence you can do with a, a recurrent neural network. Um, then there's this, which I just want to show you. So what happens with a recurrent neural network? So in this case, we're just using characters. You can train it with words, and you can use word vectors. I chose not to go into word vectors this time because I've probably presented them like a hundred times now. Um, but they, what they did with a with this is they basically fed um, a neural network, or they trained a neural network on scripts. I have to thank Will if he's in the audience because he actually showed me this. Hey, Will. <laughs> um, and uh, it's, they trained it on a whole bunch of scripts. I think it was from like horror and sci-fi um, films. And um, they got it to write the script. And then they said, cool, well, let's get people to actually act out the script. And I actually have a sound input here. Kyle, I might ask you to go turn up whatever this is plugged into. Um, yeah, sure, we can go with headphones. <laughs> I'm not even new presenting it. Okay. Okay, it does a lot of stuff. I'm gonna skip the intro stuff, but that basically explains what I told you. Come on, Josie Hub Internet, why do you do this? But, <laughs> yeah, um, what it boils down to is you'll see the limitations of what we're doing. So everyone goes, ah, oh, this stuff's magic, it can do all the things, but you've already seen, like, if you don't do it properly, it fails. Um, 
But one of the main limitations I've got with things like this, if you it goes a really long way, but eventually like we haven't quite reached like the level where we can call it creativeness because it can't tell a story. It can maybe write some lyrics that kind of look like a song, but it doesn't have context about the entire story. <laughs> just, just do the thing. Oh, oh, great. I should have picked that up. Does anyone know how to solve this on Ubuntu? I don't know if it's just my network card, but like, if connection breaks, it just sits in, continuously tries to reconnect. There we go. Okay. I can't. Okay, there we go. In a future with mass unemployment, young people are forced to sell blood. You should see the boy shut up. I was the one who was going to be 100 years old. I saw him again. The way you were sent to me. That was a big, honest idea. <laughs> I am not a bright light. <laughs> well, I have to, uh, Go to the skull. <laughs> 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 what do you mean? Oh, I, I don't know anything about any of this. So. Oh. Uh, There's no answer. So that was obviously in the script. <laughs> but it's, you have to go watch the full thing. It's hilarious, um, uh, but it, well, I think we're short for time. Cool, so that was a lot of stuff. Um, that is also the end of my presentation. <laughs> keep bloody exiting out of this thing. I think I presented a half of it, not in presentation mode. Typical. Um, so cool, so now if you need to go, obviously you're welcome to leave. Um, but if you have questions, stick around. And after that, please join us for drinks and food and beer and all the other fun things. Um, once again, if you have a question, put your hand up and you're going to get delivered the microphone. Um, so yes, questions. You're going to stand here and smile until someone asks something. <laughs> Yay, Seth asks something. <laughs> it's, it's cheap. <laughs> Do you use your laptop to train your data set? Currently. Um, so, so for these play thing, these toys, problems kind of things, so none of them, I'm not doing them very, I'm not focusing on accuracy here, I'm kind of proving a point. I can train them on here, because it takes a few hours. Um, I've got a decent graphics card in here, so that helps. Um, but even my previous laptop, which had a shittier graphics card, I shouldn't swear. Um, <laughs> being filmed, forget this. Uh, it, uh, I could still train it on there. Um, on the stuff I do at work, which is obviously stuff that actually has to work, it doesn't have to kind of get things right, uh, that we're not. So that I'm currently using the most expensive option, um, but it's fine, the client's paying for it. Uh, so I've got an Amazon, one of the Amazon GPU boxes, and that just sits there and trains. And training one run I think takes two days, but we like to run it repeated just in case it, one just gets slightly better, because that slightly better means a lot. Um, and then I sit and update data, and then we do it again, and it's a cycle. And I run things and show the client, and he goes, that looks cool. And we actually went to production with it, it was cool. But the fact is, yeah, I'm not running it on this. Um, they've got awesome, like the cheapest way to do it is actually to buy the card if you're looking to do it long run. Um, I just need to convince people, we need to put, where do you put servers? Servers, servers are a pain to keep, so we want to buy one and get like a nice, rack with a whole bunch of things, graphics cards, whatever, but we currently don't have a good location to, to keep them. Um, but you can train this majority of the stuff on your own laptop. You can train it. If you have a PC, 
better, probably have more memory, probably have a better card. Um, if you're a gamer, if you've ever done anything on VR, you've definitely got a machine that can do it. But yeah, so but all this was trained on this stupid thing, which just meant I had to just leave it there. Like, <laughs> eventually got bored, you know, tapped out, and decreased how long it was going to run for, and just did it again. So, <laughs> so yes. Anything else? Oh, you guys are the worst, man. <laughs> Flippy, yay! <laughs> Yes, so for those who didn't hear, it's like, cool, would you be able to reweight the, the network so that it actually picked up more on Picasso's kind of shapes? Would there be a way, or like, would that, would that work if I just change the, the loss function? Um, or would it, we still have to do some other things? Um, in, in my mind, the way that they're generating style is specifically based on papers that are, pick up style. And I think it's very dependent on that how they wrote that style loss function. So even if you made it count more, that loss function only tries to extract the style of a thing. Whereas I think you could do it differently if you chose to change that function. I think you could change what style meant in a way and change the ability to create shapes. So they, they use some weird matrix. What was it called? I learned about it yesterday. I'll have to look it up. But that just that solely focused on extracting style, whatever that means. But I'll send you the paper. I couldn't get through it. I read someone else who wrote the paper about the paper. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I think you'd have to tweak the style function in this particular case. Yes. You have to wait for the, the stupid mic, which doesn't really work. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wanted to ask a question based on the initial model that you had. Yeah. Um, you said you had two labels, either people who had defaulted mm -hmm. and people who hadn't defaulted as yet. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to know is in the group of people who hadn't who had not defaulted, um, how do you know that none of them would would not default in the future? You don't. So that's a that, that's why that was just an example I never showed, um, because it doesn't take into account a time component. Because what they what they did so we're not using it to predict a single person, we're using it to predict patterns, but we can only necessarily predict on that historical data. And times change, economics change, and if we're not taking that into account, we're probably severely like disadvantaging our neural network. So with that data, it might be more beneficial to actually use perhaps an RNN. So it's actually something that actually can take the historicalness, how old something is, into account, so they can see like, oh, people are defaulting on their loans less when they're like this, to take into account the changes. So in that case, no, yeah, it wouldn't. It probably would be very bad at predicting people de defaulting on their loans now. It was just the only example that was better than the really easy examples everyone else gives. It was like a clear one, I guess. Cool. Anything else? Cool. If that's all, I'm, I'm happy with three questions. Uh, thanks, guys. Please go download code. Um, ask me questions afterwards. Ask me questions in the future. So give me a call and ask me questions because I went through this very fast, but I want you guys to at least leave knowing something, even if it's a little bit. Did, did people, hand, show of hands, did people learn something? Oh, yay! Okay, I don't feel so bad. Okay, cool. Uh, thank you very much, guys. So this is um, the Rabbiteer session. If this is your first one, thank you for coming. If this is your, uh, if you've been to a couple of others, you'll know about the next ones. Those who've come for the first time, I hope you enjoyed yourself. Um, we've got more. Our next one is in September. Um, it'll be on languages, in particular Go, which is our favorite at the moment. And people are not in. <laughs> um, so yeah, so it'll be on Go, and after that we're doing one on IoT, and that will be in towards the end of the year. Those will be in Pretoria. So we do offer transport and shuttles from the Gau train if you want to come, and we shuff, shuff, shuttles back. And uh, we'll likely be doing, and if we can, we're going to try fit in another one, a smaller one, um, for the end of the year. We're building a Bromfortine office. So we'd like to have our next Jovic session there. Um, so yeah, so hopefully we'll be seeing you guys again and go have fun. I'm going to stop talking. Goodbye. Okay,